every year wildfires rage across thousands of kilometers in an annual season of devastation that appears to be getting worse. So th there are two things that worry me about the current state of affairs of wildfires. That's Guillermo Rain, a professor of fire science at Imperial College London. One is human, is that I'm very surprised continuously over my career of how little does humanity know about wildfires. And the other one is more natural, the massive influence of the climate that is changing. And the fact that we still don't understand how it will affect it is something that worries me significantly. That's because, as you're probably aware if you're watching this video, wildfires can be extremely destructive. Very fast, very tall flames, massive plumes of the smoke. The fire itself is altering the weather. Zombie fires, particularly toxic, even more toxic. Horrific. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Before we get to the fire and brimstone, let's get the basics out of the way first. Lesson one, not all wildfires are bad. Wildfire was invented by nature and discovered by humans. Uh, they are very, very old phenomena in the planet and nature has a role for wildfires. There are wildfires that are good and there are wildfires that are bad. Good wildfires burn off dead vegetation, leaving nutrient-rich soil in their wake for new plants to grow in. But bad fires can destroy healthy ecosystems and threaten people's lives and their property. They can even affect the weather. When there is a large wildfire with uh, and large flames, very tall flames, and they produce a lot of heat, and that creates massive plumes of the smoke that go up into the atmosphere. And then when these uh, plumes of the smoke enter into the atmosphere, they might actually start to condense some of the water. And they actually start producing large winds and large clouds. And they start producing a macro weather system, their own. So the fire itself is altering the weather around, creating wind and sometimes even storms. And these storms can actually become so large that they produce their own lighting which will be another mechanism of creating wildfires that are farther away from the active uh, flame front. There are three main types of wildfires. If you can imagine a forest stand, if the canopy is burning and the fires are spreading on the really top of the trees, that's a very big fire, it spreads very fast. Then it could be that it's the ground fuels, the bush and the, and the bottom of the trees that are burning. Those can also really be very fast fires. And then you have the soil itself that is burning. That would be peatlands, for example. Uh, the peatlands fires in particular, they might not have a flame. They might be smoldering without a flame and, and they produce uh, different types of smokes, particularly toxic, and they behave in a different way. Wildfires happen all across the globe, but there are some places on Earth which are particularly susceptible. Sub-Saharan Africa is always really busy with uh, a lot of grass fires. We see the Amazon always has fires. We see Australia is a particular region, it's a continent that is very active in wildfires. Europe, the Mediterranean, has the conditions for a significant amount of activity of wildfires, where there is also a lot of people, which is very concerning. And the United States has the East Coast and the West Coast. And the last region of the planet that has traditionally less activity of wildfires but the satellites is picking up a higher activity compared to the past is the boreal and the arctic parts. And now wildfires in the arctic are not a small thing. They're actually very large fires. We know very little about them. And we think that climate change has a big role playing into why are these fires in the arctic taking place. We'll get back to those arctic fires later, right after lesson two. Ignition. There are two main types of ignition of wildfires, the natural one and the anthropogenic. Anthropogenic is by humans. The natural one, the most typical one, is lightning strikes. So lightning strikes happen, they, they, they release an incredible amount of electric energy into a tree or different parts of the forest and that actually ignites within minutes or within hours. There is a wildfire that has started naturally. But nature's not the only culprit. We humans can produce wildfires accidentally most of the time. We don't want this to happen, but it happens. Um, and then there's the one that anthropogenic uh, purposeful ignition. This is almost arson behavior or uh, as well when there is uh, management of fire on purpose and it goes wrong. In the United States, studies have shown that 87% of all wildfires are started as a result of human behavior, be that accidental or otherwise. Once a wildfire has started, there are four main environmental factors that determine the speed at which it spreads. The first one is humidity. 
the, more, the drier is the fuel, the faster the fire is going to propagate. The second one is wind. The, the fire propagates really fast in the direction of the wind. Uh, it can propagate against the wind, but it will move much slower. Uh, the third one is the temperature of the air. The higher the temperature of the air, the drier is the fuel, the more preheated is the fuel, and the faster will be the spread. And the last one is topography, or the terrain. Um, fires uh, propagate faster up the hill, and they propagate slower down the hill. If you, there's a wildfire and you are escaping the wildfire, never try to escape the fire such that you are up the hill from the fire. Never. It's very dangerous. These four factors dictate how firefighters tackle the blaze on the ground and how any other support, such as air tankers, will be deployed to help them. The most successful way to stop a fire is to send ground crews, to crew people to the ground, that they start removing fuel in the path of the fire such that when the fire arrives, it literally stops there because there is no more fuel. But that takes time. So one thing that helps them, for example, is to throw water in the path of the fire, not to stop the fire, but to slow it down and give more time to the crews that are working ahead of the fire to remove the fuel. These techniques work when fighting a forest or a grass fire, but when there's no visible flame to put out, the job gets a lot trickier. One of the wildfire phenomena that we study here at Imperial College is uh, smoldering fires that are burning peat. Peat is soil that is rich in carbon and uh, under the right conditions of humidity, when it's dry, it actually is flammable and it burns but without a flame, it smolders. Uh, it propagates very slowly but it's very difficult to suppress so no air tanker can actually stop these fires. Uh, what, what we have to do is we have to avoid them getting very large because um, if they get very large, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of, of hectares, then the only way to stop it is to reflat the land. Pitlands are meant to be wet, naturally, if for whatever the reason they are not, we will have to bring the water back. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of cubic meters of water. In the tropics, this happens naturally with the arrival of the monsoon season and the epic deluge that comes with it. After two weeks of continuous rain, then the pitlands start to naturally be flooded and then the, the fire will be put off. But until then, a smouldering peat fire can make life pretty nasty for people living near it. The smoke it produces is particularly toxic. Uh, this smoke is not very buoyant, so it doesn't go up into the atmosphere, it stays attached to the ground, mixes with the surrounding air and actually, actually moves into populations, into cities, into towns. And it becomes the air they have to breathe for, for weeks and months. It's what is called haze phenomena, it is horrific, um, it leads to emergencies, uh, health emergencies, respiratory emergencies. For example, in Indonesia, in Singapore as well, uh, the authorities start saying that people should not go outside to do exercise, that air conditioning should be on to filter particles. It leads to this horrible scenario where the, the, the pollution source cannot be turned off and until the wind arrives, they will not be able to clean the smoke away. If that's not apocalyptic enough, in certain conditions, peat fires can morph into a phenomenon that sounds truly terrifying. When there are fires in the Arctic, it means that the fire can actually start burning the, the, the soil rich in carbon and start to have very large smoldering fires. And then these smoldering fires can actually go deeper into the soil. They might actually go so deep that they are protected when the snow and the cold season arrives, but they still be burning under. People refer to them as zombie fires because they they are not dead, or they were dead and they are coming back alive. And then when the, when the spring arrives and the snow melts, the fire is able to come back from the deep uh, depths of the, of the soil and it start to have another flaming fire uh, without any ignition source. The good news is the number of fires around the world is not increasing. But it's not really good news once you hear the bad. What is increasing is the size of the fire. So we are seeing more of the bigger fires, which is particularly worrisome because the small fires are, could be literally the good fires, but the large fires are rarely, are rarely good fires. And the trend of seeing even more of the larger fires is keeping people, is keeping professionals very worried about the, the future. Wildfire behavior is changing. It's changing because of three simultaneous changes. We see people are moving in and out of rural areas of the forest and that means that um, more fires or less fires can happen. We see people are changing the use of the land from agricultural land to being abandoned or the other way around. Uh, jungle now becomes a plantation. That actually changes uh, also fire behavior. 
And the third one is the climate is changing. In different parts of the world, there are different types of behaviors in the climate that are changing. These three changes means that we are not for sure what is gonna happen in a particular location of the Earth in the next 10 years, but some regions, for example, Southeast Asia, the Mediterranean, or California, if they don't do anything, they would expect more fires and bigger fires. And that brings us back to lesson one. Not all wildfires are bad. The good fires has to be promoted. If we are not promoting, if we are not allowing the good fires to develop, it means the ecosystems that we have are not natural and they will be evolving into a different type of ecosystem. So if we like the ecosystems that we have, if we like the forests that we have and we like the, the heatlands that we have, we would need to pr promote the understanding of when fire is doing things that are good for the ecosystem and promote the good fires and avoid the bad fires.